ordinals are one of the biggest developments that we've seen in the history of Bitcoin. Can you give a brief overview of what they are and how it's impacting the Bitcoin builder landscape? Yeah, I think it's it's very, very exciting. It actually, uh, I, I, I think I've said this multiple times that there was a different sort of a Bitcoin builders culture between 2013 when I started to 2016. And since 2017, there has been this strange period where all new innovations are kind of like pushed away and other, other chains are doing it. And, and Bitcoin is sort of like sitting on the sidelines. We are obviously trying to change that. And Ordinals like came out of nowhere. And I think it, it they came out at the right time and with the right sort of like a, you know, sort of like a fun little thing angle um, that is just igniting uh, interest in the Bitcoin builders culture again. And I do think they're very interesting. I do think they're sort of a new concept. Like some people think of them as just like Bitcoin NFTs. I think they're more than just NFTs and they're actually a different sort of a medium. Uh, so a little bit of a history that Bitcoin got a upgrade taproot uh, after, uh, after a very long time. This was the first major upgrade that happened like uh, since SegWit, like way back. And over there, Taproot was touted by certain circles in, in the Bitcoin community as sort of like a smart contract upgrade. It's really not. It uh, helps with certain advanced scripts, but these are not like fully expressive contracts that like the ones you're used to on Ethereum or Solana and so on, right? So, but, but Taproot does give you a little bit more um, ability to program scripts in a way where uh, things can be more private, or you could compress certain certain things and use less space on the Bitcoin L1, right? So think of Taproot as like, you know, slightly more advanced scripting that, that you can do. So one side effects of Taproot ended up being that you can actually embed uh, significantly more data on the Bitcoin L1 directly. And what the Ordinals uh, authors did is that they're sort of uh, there's, they're sort of listing UTXOs in an order. So, you know, just numbering them like one, two, three, four, five. And then uh, using Taproot, um, this, this interesting byproduct of Taproot, you can actually embed much more data. So you can embed like full images on chain. And I think when this happened, it was kind of, kind of interesting. I think Udi and a couple of other people were, were behind this. Um, so I, I actually tweeted out a hash uh, of a ordinal that wasn't live yet, along with like a bunch of other people, Udi, Udi pinged it to me. And um, then I think maybe a day or two later, uh, a Bitcoin miner actually mined the largest uh, uh, Bitcoin block. It was around four, four MB. And you saw like this massive image that's like embedded in, in, in the chain itself. And the hash, the hash was actually the hash of the, of the image. And that was, that was like, it's very hard to not notice something like that, right? Like the largest Bitcoin blog mined directly there. Now there's this image of a wizard basically like, like sitting on chain. And I think that's like such a unusual thing that obviously will get attention from everybody. And that just sparked interest, uh, interest from developers, interest from, you know, people who are against ordinals, like, you know, debates are happening around it. But the interesting thing is these transactions are valid as far as Bitcoin is concerned. So no one can stop it. Like that's where I think uh, in the end, building a open and, and free system really matters because even if somebody is arguing that people shouldn't be doing this on Twitter, it basically doesn't matter because the network is open, it's decentralized. Anyone who wants to do whatever they want, they can do it. And I think that's actually a win for Bitcoin, right? Like it proves that this is uh, censorship resistant. No one can stop people from doing the things that they're doing. And it's actually good for Bitcoin fees. Right, like uh, there have been arguments, uh, some coming from the Ethereum community, that what is Bitcoin security budget going to be long term as the Coinbase rewards keep going down? We have roughly ten years or so before the Coinbase rewards actually actually become very small, um, and and this just shows that Bitcoin's block space uh, carries a premium. Right, Bitcoin is the largest asset. It is the most decentralized, most secure chain, and a lot of people believe. That if there's one blockchain that survives for you know or decades or even 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 centuries, it'll be the Bitcoin chain. So people will pay a premium to put something in the in the Bitcoin chain, and obviously that is revenue for miners, right? And that can translate into all sorts of you know profits for miners and long-term sustainability of the 
of the Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin security and so on. So I think overall, uh, yes, there are some concerns as well, and and we, we can get into it if you want. But overall, I think it's a very very healthy healthy thing for Bitcoin. Uh, so many people who sort of like forgot about Bitcoin because they wanted to play with NFTs and other other types of experimental things. They're now booting up Bitcoin nodes. They're 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 trying to kind of like come in and almost like reconnect uh, with with Bitcoin. And a lot of developers like uh, the infrastructure and dev tooling around Bitcoin uh, needs a lot of work. Like we experienced that firsthand trying trying to build in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And suddenly there's a lot of interest from wallet providers, API providers. Uh, folks who want to come in and support these Bitcoin NFTs and so on. And I think that's a very, very healthy thing uh, for the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole. 